afternoon at 2 p.m. There will be a discussion and uh, a presentation of the budget for 2012, and you will have an opportunity to affect and ultimately approve whatever comes out of that meeting as a budget for the, this year. John also wanted to let you know that he's going to be out of town for several days. I guess you're going to be back Wednesday. They're going to Atlanta for uh, uh, Louise to have a follow-up visit. And so we'll keep you in our prayers as you travel and hope for the best in any uh, information that you glean from that visit. Uh, and now we have Michelle that would like to read something from Rick. Is that correct? I know a lot of you have been asking. I got an email from Rick last night. And it reads, we are free. The doctors released Ricky from the hospital this afternoon. Thirteen days. The kidneys are still not back to normal, but they still continue to improve daily, but they are slowing down. He will have to have blood tests every other day and must drink at least two liters of water daily, but they think that he will eventually heal. Seven more days of proton treatments, finishing up on January 31st. We will then have to go back to Riley Hospital for overnight chemo out around noon on the 1st, and we will be back in Mobile on the 2nd. Both of us cannot wait to see everyone and see the warm weather again. I talked to him this morning. It was 28 degrees. Ice storm last night in Bloomington. Quarter-inch layer of ice everywhere. Roads are not too bad but now, but I cannot even walk to our mailbox. I've already broken my tailbone once. I'm not going to do that again. And the second part is a testimonial. Um, I know Roger and um, Tim heard about a little roommate of Ricky's. I can't read it because I cry every time I read it, so I got Ashley to read it for me. I learned a lesson today, a lesson that was discussed at church recently. I cannot remember if it was before we left or if it was one of the internet sermons we watched, but it was about being ready since you never know when God will need you to be his messenger. Two days after Ricky was admitted into the hospital and was going downhill quickly, he was given a roommate, a nine-year-old boy with an aggress aggressively growing brain tumor. It was discovered on December 13th, the same day we arrived in Indiana. Emergent Emergency brain surgery was done the next day to remove as much of the tumor as possible. He got to go home for Christmas with his family, and during, and during a follow-up PET scan the first week of January, it was discovered that the tumor was growing back rapidly. He was admitted, yeah, he was admitted and shared Ricky's room. After receiving his first radiation treatment, his night and pain, no, his brain began to swell, causing breathing and heart issues as well as excruciating pain. He would scream out at night in pain and kept asking his parents why, the, why this was happening to him. Ricky was, to be honest, fading fast. I had already told Michelle to check on flights as she may have to get up here and say goodbye to him at any moment. Even though my heart was breaking and I had no one close by to help me through this, well, I had one person, I had God, and God told me to go and help this young boy's parents. They were scared and they did not know what to do. So with Ricky's kidneys failing fast and he's asleep due to, due to the morphine, I stepped around the curtain to talk to them. His name is Paul and his eyes lit up when he saw me. You see, I was wearing my Alabama Crimson Tide shirt since they had just won the BCS championships the night before. You see, Paul had a saving grace, even in Indiana. He was a Crimson Tide fan. His parents and I talked for an hour about what they can expect going forward. I told them the best that I could about his head pain. I had meningitis about 20 years ago, so I knew the pain he was in. I gave them tips to help him through this and that they had to, had to trust in God. Afterwards, I learned that Michelle and my kids and the scouts were coming up for the holiday. I knew, I knew what had to be done. I called Michelle and told her to go to the Academy Sports and buy Paul a national champion shirt. 
Unfortunately, unfortunately, I did not get to give the shirt to Paul. He moved to ICU the day it arrived. I gave it to a, a nurse to give to him. I did not find out anything else. I did not find anything else about how he was doing until the day I was loading up the truck for Ricky to go to finally get to go home. His dad saw me and we started to talk. He wanted our contact info so that he could properly thank me in the future when things when things calmed down. He called me a blessing. He called me a blessing talking to him and his wife about what Paul was going through, making them understand his pain. What was the odds that they would have a roommate with some with someone who knew firsthand what he was experiencing? And he called me an angel of his son's nash for his son's national shirt. You see, the day he received the shirt and saw it, his brain stopped swelling, his fluid balance came back came back into line, his heart started working correctly, and his tumor started reacting to the radiation and started shrinking. He still has a long road ahead of him, but at least they now have hope. I fully believe that God spoke and acted through me that day. And afterwards, I was more relaxed and calm with Ricky's situation. He started to get better the next day as well. So always be ready, be prepared, for you never know when God is going to ask, to ask for you to spread his love. sing that uh, and I apologize that I had not included that in the bulletin. I'd like to welcome you all this morning and caution you to lay off the Girl Scout cookies. We don't want you to get hyperactive uh, because I know you're all carrying a box or two with you. Um, a couple of administrative things as far as the service is concerned. Dick and Lib are doing the prayer for peace and lighting the candle, and I would uh, encourage you to listen closely to the words of this prayer that will be read as a part of that uh, section in the bulletin. And then the hymn right before the morning message when Wayne brings us his thoughts for the day, Jesus is calling. We're going to sing that a cappella. We will remain seated, so listen. I will start the song for us. And now, our call to worship. Jesus said, Anyone who receives you receives me. And anyone who receives me receives the Father who sent me. Sisters and brothers, boys and girls, we gather together in the presence of the God who receives us with open arms, who loves us unconditionally, and who bids us 
do the same to one another. May God bless us as we worship together. just now with thanksgiving and praise our father we have heard your voice calling to us and we have come to worship and we have come to hear your inspired words we have come to feel the love of this congregational family and we've come to renew our commitments that we've made to you and so our father we pray that you will Bless this service with your gracious spirit. May each of us feel your spirit and may each of us know your will for us in our lives. And may we respond the way that you would have us respond. For our Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. how wonderful is our opportunity to share with you our feelings about peace. These feelings are mixed with concerns, and they are surrounded with hopes and desires. Send thy peace, O Lord, which is perfect and everlasting, that our souls may radiate peace. Send thy peace, O Lord, that we may think, act, and speak harmoniously. Send thy peace, O Lord, that we may be contented and thankful for the beautiful gifts. Send thy peace, O Lord, that amidst our worldly strife we may enjoy thy bliss. Send thy peace, O Lord, that we may endure all, tolerate all, in the thought of thy grace and mercy. Send thy peace, O Lord, 
that our lives may become a divine vision, and in thy light all darkness may vanish. Send thy peace, O Lord, our Father and Mother, that we, thy children on earth, may all unite in one family. What is God's greatest gift? Most people will say that it is the gift of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that carried away our sins. But we need to look around in our world and look at the miracles that He's created that we see every day and probably take for granted because we're not in tune to that. And so part of our mission is to appreciate God's beneficial creation of our world. It's always something to see, just to go out into the yard and watch the grass and the trees and the birds and the bushes. And then you can go to the grocery store and just look in the produce section and see all the varieties of things. I often think how much fun God must have had creating all of these things. And if I'm ever permitted, I'd sure like to ask him about that. At any rate, today, because the church runs on money, we have to collect an offering from each one of you. Everybody that is possible to give, give what they can, give as they can. Now, the ushers will come forward. Almighty and everlasting Father, we are grateful and we are thankful for the many blessings that you have given to us. Now is our time to give some of it back. Thank you, Father, for this world and for this church and for this country. Bless this money that we spend it the wisest way possible. Bless the people that give. Bless this congregation, Father, as you have been doing. Give us the strength and the wisdom to know the best way to go. Thank you, Father, and thank you for the miracle of your Son, Jesus. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Some weeks ago, George emailed Marty and had a copy of the program and said to ask Wayne if there was uh, anything that I wanted to be part of this hour. And the only thing that <clears throat> I really didn't want to start like this. <laughs> The only thing that came to my mind was this song. Little did I know at that time that it would be the song that we closed the hour with last Sunday. I told George last Sunday, he asked, said, well, I guess we're going to sing that song again. I said, well, <laughs> maybe God is trying to tell us something. Maybe he is a little bit smarter than we are. Sheila last week spoke to you about Lord, speak to me. And about how we listen for that voice. And did a great job, Sheila. In fact, I kind of got a little concerned as to how I was going to be able to follow you up. I know we don't try to top one another, but I just want to get up on that level if I could. Because so Sheila did a tremendous job, and I was really blessed by what she said last Sunday. And I told her it leads us really into what we want to share here this morning. And that is respond to God's call. So for the next few moments here, I'm going to ask you to do something with me and for me, and that is I want you to use your imagination. I want you to kind of let your mind open and, and just use your imagination and visualize what I'm saying is in your mind's eye. Imagine that you're in your office or at the desk at maybe the school that you're a teacher. And sitting in front of you is your computer, and you're working on, you're looking at the screen, and you're working very diligently on a project that's due in the next few days. So it's very important that you finish this project. When all of a sudden, there comes a knock on your door. And you wonder who is, you know, cat could be. I need to finish this. I don't need any interruptions. But you pause and you get up and you open the door. And there stands a man who's slightly familiar to you that you have seen somewhere, maybe around the office building or in the school cafeteria or wherever that you, you know, the place that you work or each and every day. And you greet each other for just a moment, and then he says, forget about that project. Come follow me, and I will give you many projects of human need that will enrich your life. And so you immediately turn, and you close the, pro you close the computer down, you put away your notes, and down the hallway, you follow this man. Imagine that you're retired. And it's a beautiful Saturday morning, and you find yourself, Billy, on the golf course. And you're at the first tee, and you're just about ready to tee off, and you notice a man that's walking down the fairway. And you really can't tell who it is, but he keeps coming closer and closer and closer. And finally, he walks right up to you. And you exchange greetings back and forth for just a moment. And he says, why don't you put off 
this golf game and come follow me and I will bring you excitement and pleasure to your retirement years. You immediately put up your golf clubs, put them in the cart, and follow this man down the golf path. Imagine that you're a college student at home for the summer break. You're kind of laying around, really not nothing particular to do, and so you have your smartphone and you're checking all the messages and texting friends back and forth and just basically mostly killing time. You hear the doorbell ring and you want, oh, it's probably someone looking for a donation. And so you pause and you hesitate for just a moment. But the doorbell rings again and so finally you get up and you go and you answer the door and there stands a very distinguished gentleman. He says to you, why don't you put away your smartphone, leave your parents and this home, and come follow Jesus. You try to call your mom to let her know where you're going and what you're doing, but she's out to lunch and can't be reached, so you just leave her a note. And down the street you walk, knowing not exactly where you're headed. Lastly, imagine that you make your living catching fish in the Sea of Galilee. It's early one morning, and you have gone down to put your nets and fishing equipment in your boat and to get ready for the day's work. You row out to the nearest reef. And you're just about to cast your net into the sea when all of a sudden you see this individual on the seashore. You really can't tell who it is, but he's waving his arms to get your attention. He begins to call out to you, and you can't really hear what he's saying, but he gets a little closer, and you get a little closer, and finally you're able to understand what he's saying. He says, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, you leave your nets and your boat, and you follow him. Now, if we think about these four scenarios, these little stories, or whatever you want to call them, I'm sure that you know that I have made those up, except for the last one. And you would say, Wayne, this is a little bit crazy, don't you think? No one is going to do what you just got through telling me that we did. No one is going to leave their parents. No one is going to leave their job. No one is going to get up off the couch and leave their home. No one is going to follow a stranger that they just met only moments before simply because we were invited to follow this person. But in the last story that I told, a little scenario, I didn't make it up. It is completely true. It's recorded in the book of Mark. And it's the first chapter. Excuse me, let me get my little eyes out here. I want to read this to you because you know you're familiar with it, but I still I want you to understand exactly how it's recorded in the Scriptures. And it says, And now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come after me, come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway 
they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the ship mending their nets. And he called to them, and straightway they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. When you read that, or when you heard it read, do not you wonder what caused these men to leave their father, to leave their careers, to leave their jobs, to leave their boats, to leave their nets, to leave all that they actually knew to follow this man named Jesus. What prompted those men to leave what they were doing and straightway follow the, who they did not know at the time to be the Christ? There was a group of elementary age children that were asked this question this in a Christian school, this very question, why did John... and James, and Andrew, and Peter leave their boats, and their careers, and their families, and follow this person, Jesus. Because as I say, surely at this point, they did not know really who Jesus was. They knew that he was some kind of a teacher, and maybe even and they'd seen him preaching in the streets, you know, and the things he did, and that he gave, had some gift of, of healing. But they did not know, they did not know, he was the Christ, the Messiah, the God's Son. So what prompted them to leave their boats? Well, these children, they come up with some pretty good answers. And like children are, they said, well, maybe they just weren't catching fish. And that makes pretty good sense. And of course, as a, as a young person would say, they were probably just bored. They just needed a change. They just needed something to give them a little excitement for the day. Or maybe they knew that Jesus was very popular among the Jewish people right then at that point in time. And they thought, if we follow him, we'll be popular too. And then Lashley said, well, they could leave, and then they, if his things didn't work out, you know what? They could always come back to fishing. Amid all these possibilities, which all were pretty good and pretty sound, there is one that stands out maybe a little above all the rest. Were they or could they possibly simply been moved by the Spirit of God to follow this man, Jesus. You know, if we ask those disciples, they could probably not even give you a reason why they followed the Christ. Not a good reason. They may not have recognized who he was at that time, and so their decision really was not a rational decision. It wasn't one that was based on fact or something that they knew. Because the good Lord did not offer them money or riches or fame or all those things. He simply said, come, follow me. But something, brothers and sisters, inside of them. They just knew something inside of them that this was a call from God which at that point in their life they really didn't understand and would not until later. So now this morning as we sit here in this sanctuary we ask the question of ourselves. What motivates you? What motivates you to follow Jesus Christ? Or if we brought it down to a more practical situation in which we find ourselves this morning, 
What motivates you to come to church today? Why are you here? What is the reason that you have come and you sit in that pew in which I look into your faces this morning? Why are you here at this particular time, at this particular moment? Well, maybe it could be because over the past 40, 50, maybe 60 years, that's what you've done. Maybe it's become kind of a habit. Maybe it's even a required duty. Maybe it's because there are friends and family that sit beside you or behind you or in front of you and you just wanted to be with them and to share with them and fellowship with them today. Maybe you came for personal peace that you might sit in silent prayer in the confines of this setting in this sanctuary. Kind of to recharge yourself for the week. Maybe it's because you're lonely and need some companionship or have questions in your life that you need to have answered. Or maybe you're just looking for a new place to worship. You see, all of these could be reasons why we sit here this morning. But would they answer the question, why we follow Jesus Christ? Maybe, just maybe, you're sitting here in your favorite pew because in some unexplainable way, the Spirit of God has brought you to renew, here to renew your faith and commitment in His Son, Jesus Christ. You're here because God has called you, brothers and sisters. That voice that Sheila referred to last week, that voice that speaks to us in times when we least expect it to sometimes, maybe you have been called to be here. You see, the Lord needs you. Not just to be another warm body, to occupy a space in one of our pews in this congregation. But he needs you. He needs your heart. He needs your hands. He needs your feet. He needs all of you. God has called you, maybe, to be here. And even like one of those disciples, maybe you're not even aware of it yet. Jesus says, follow me. It's a question that will, it, the question is, will you leave your fishing nets? Will you be like Peter and James and John and Andrew? Will you pursue the path that Christ walks? Will you respond to his call and if so the question is who is then this Jesus that we talk about following who is Jesus Christ that we are called to follow you know Jesus wanted to know he, he wanted to not to ask that question but he wanted to know from those disciples you remember in the scriptures he said who do men say that I am? Who, this, who am I? And they begin to relate, you know, they say, some say you're John the Baptist, come back to life. And some say you're Elias. And some say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Some say you might even be the forerunner of the Messiah. They had all of these answers. And Jesus listened to all of that. But in the end, at the final analysis, what Jesus wanted to know. He says, but who do you say that I am? I am sure that this morning, Jesus wants to know that from us. Just like he wanted to know from those disciples that he called. He wants to know from us who 
do you say that I am? Now, we all know that from our teaching and our rearing and our background and our memberships in the church and all the things that we can say, he's the Messiah, the Son of God, he's the Lamb, he's this, he's that, he's all these things. We have all the answers. We don't have to grope for the answer. We have all the answers. But the Christ wants to know who do you say that I am? We've just celebrated through Christmas time the birth of God's Son. And so the question is do we believe that this little baby boy lying in a manger born of lowly parents in a little town of Bethlehem among animals and shepherds and so forth is that the Christ? Do we believe that he lives today? That he was born, that he lived, that he died on a cross, and that he rose three days later, and today he calls to us through that voice that we listen for, that we calls us to follow me. Who do you say that I am? It's a question that has been asked for 2,000 years now. The disciples first spoke of Christ as someone that God sent. They recognized it, yet God must have sent this person. Later they began to say that God was with him as he ministered to and they experienced things in his life. But then, after his resurrection, when he was crucified... On the cross, laid in a tomb, and three days later they experienced his presence in their midst. They knew. They knew that God was in him. Not with him, not sent by him, but with him. He was and is Jesus Christ our Lord. He says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes unto the Father but by me. His call, his call is for each of us. Come to me. Follow me. Believe in me. Those first disciples that he asked that question to, and Peter responded so positively, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. You see, those disciples couldn't remain neutral whenever they were asked that question. They had to decide. They had to choose. They either had to accept Jesus or they had to reject Him. They had to follow Him to the cross or they had to depart from His presence. And I would suggest today that you and I that sit here together and worship together cannot remain neutral. We must decide. We have to choose. You see, whenever Jesus comes into our lives, we cannot ignore him. He expects a decision. He expects us to respond to his call. Who do you say that I am? It is said that Martin Luther once made the statement, I care not, I care not whether Jesus be the Christ. but that he be the Christ in you. It's not important if we understand and believe that Jesus was the Christ, but is he? Is he the Lord Jesus Christ in you? We are embarking on a new year. A time to look back a time to review where we have come from and where we want to go. 
as a congregation and as individuals. Where were you last January? And I don't mean where were you physically. Maybe you were sitting in, a, in this congregation. Maybe you were at home. Maybe you were out of town, wherever. But where were you spiritually last January? What did you intend to do for the Lord in the next 12 months of 2011? Have you grown from that time in January to what you are today? Has anything changed in your life? Are you more committed to Jesus than you were 12 months ago? Have you responded to God's call? When I read and I kind of put that down, I thought of John. John Sebastian I'm talking about. And I remember John standing and bearing testimony that he could not deny the Lord Jesus. He knew that he was called to, to become the presiding elder for this congregation, and he could not deny serving in that call. In the Doctrine and Covenants, section 155, we read, probably one of my favorite counsels from our Heavenly Father that's recorded here in the Doctrine and Covenants and modern day scripture. And these words are, Know, O my people, the time for hesitation is past. The earth, my creation, groans for the liberating truths of my gospel, which have been given for your salvation, for the salvation of the world. Test my words. Test my words. Trust in my promises, for they have been given for your assurance and will bear you up in times of doubt. Be not overly concerned about methods as you go forth to witness in my name. There are many techniques for proclaiming my word which may be used as needs and circumstances dictate. The call, the call is for workers in the cause of Zion. Not for pew sitters, not for warm bodies. The call is for workers in the cause of Zion. Therefore, neither tarry nor doubt that I am. I know your perplexities and I am aware of your uncertainties. But here comes that promise. But if you will call upon my name, my spirit will go before you into whatsoever place that you are sent. And I will, and I will continue to bless you as you have need. The call is for workers. How will we respond? We have heard the voice. How will we respond to God's call? I believe it comes down to just like Martin Luther said. I care not. I care not if he be the Christ. But is he? Is he the Christ in you? I leave you this morning with one question, and that would be, is he?
us pray. Oh Lord God, you have blessed us so much in our lives and this day and this worship. Thank you, Father, for the spirit that comes and ministers to us. And give us courage and strength, Lord, that as we go forth, that we can focus on you, focus on the love that goes for every person. And Father, we would ask a blessing upon these people that their love will see them through because your love will keep them in love and courage and wisdom and joy. Father, you call us and we call for you. We say, yes, Lord. We will go in your name. And Father, bless these people with that Holy Spirit that goes with serving all people. Bless them, Lord, to be your servants. We do ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.